So joining us this week, we have two guys coming from the UK and they are bringing us their, uh, the behind the scenes on one of the uh, exciting new labels coming out uh, to everybody uh, in the Blu-ray world. And that is Treasured Films. We have Graham Lloyd and Tom Lee. Uh, come on. Rutter. See, he got it. Oh, that, I was, it wasn't I, that I hard. Him, I, 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 I had so much faith in you. I, I wanted so him to say it because it would have, it, 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 there was no way I was going to get out. I, I, I kind of like, like pressure got to me. And then at the last minute, I forgot it. Um, it doesn't matter how long ago he told me literally like uh, less a than a minute ago, he told me it. And then I forgot it already. Um, it's cause I suck at this, but it's okay. Yeah. Um, I know practice makes perfect sometimes. Well, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> not in this case, but, uh, I'm going to give myself a break, but thanks guys for coming. Thanks for guys for joining us this week. Thank you. But pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having us. Oh, of course, man. We, we're excited, uh, always excited about uh, new labels joining joining the the big the game as we like to call it, because uh, you know there's tons of boule- uh, boutique labels popping up all the time and uh, and uh, in introducing us to new films and introducing us to reintroducing us and of course your first release was the uh, you know Vietnam exploitation uh, film The Last Hunter, uh, great release here. Look at this thing; it is beautiful. It's well put together. Um, you know, he, he, he can't, can't get much better than this for a first release, I think. So, uh, we'll get into this, um, and, uh, see, see if we can, we can pull any other information out of these guys, uh, to get any teases. Maybe, maybe they'll share some, some interesting up, up and coming stuff. Um, but of course we, we also want to go into your backgrounds and see why, how you got here. Um, but I do want to, let's just get into the personal, a little bit on the personal side, um, about, uh the love of movies. That's where this all begins is our love for film. So let's start with Graham. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your, your beginnings when it came, came to, inter, you know, getting into film. Uh, well, really I've been a, a physical media collector for a good many years. Um, you know, I like the whole package. Uh, obviously you, you, you have the film itself presented in the best quality possible, but um, then you also have the package in and they look great. And, you like to display them on, on your shelf at home. And uh, as my wife constantly tells me, you've got too much stuff. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't listen to her and just uh, keep buying my stuff. I, the problem is, of course, you, you get up to this situation where you have a ridiculous to watch pile. Um, and, and then it, sometimes it becomes more of a stress than a pleasure because you think, well, I've got to get through this. I've got to get through this. And when you start making some headway, you buy a little more. Um, but yeah, really, it's just a passion for film. I'm a big uh, physical media uh, film buff. Um, and so, you know, after sort of several years of collecting, um, I just thought, well, you know, why, why don't I do my own thing? Um, not not to be better than anyone else, but um, really just to put out films and content and packaging that I was interested in. Um, so yeah, we've 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 begun with uh, and as you signed to say the the last hunter. Um, we we think we, we think we've done a reasonable job on that. Um, really surprised that it was available. To be honest, I thought that somebody would have picked that up a long time ago. Um, you know, and um, it was a great film, Antonio Margariti or Antonio Margariti. Like yeah, you got to say it like that. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Uh, David Warbeck, who we love, and I thought probably this was the only time I was going to put a film out starring him. So I wanted to do a bit of tribute to him as well. Um, so therefore, you know, we had a lot of material uh, for the booklet and uh, and digitally on the disc as well. Um, yeah, but um, we put it out, and um, I don't think it's a bad debut release. Hey, Tom? No, it's a. Uh... Right, I would buy it. Yeah, thanks. Well, why don't you? you <laughs> I, might, I might have to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> see, how the, see how the figures look. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's always, you know, we always are, are kind of uh, uh, astonished when a new label pops up because we know that, you know, doing Blu-rays and, and it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a niche market. You know, it's not, not every, you know, and we know that DVDs sell more you know, still yeah. in, to this day to the general public, it's still the, the higher uh, format for selling things. But, but 
there is a market. I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of passionate people that are buying Blu-rays and, and 4Ks and, and doing this thing. Um, and and I could say before you even told us about your background and like that, really, this is all about you you being a collector as well as why you wanted to do this. Is uh, I, I could tell that all from your your about from on your website. Uh, your about was literally kind of that. You know, I could tell you were a collector because you you describe all the things that a collector would want from you, you know a releases and and you and it's just it's very it's very you know to the T. Like, hey, we're gonna bring out the the, be the best features possible. You know, the yeah. best packaging we can. Like, yeah. and we're gonna work as long on it as possible before we do the next thing. You know, that's and yeah. that's what we want. You know, and that's. We don't need. I mean, I, God bless the the arrows and the for the five or six releases a a month and the you know the kinos ten releases a day and the you know. But but it's it's sometimes it's okay when it, when a label only puts out like one a month or one every couple months and like yeah. you know takes their time with one film and and really puts all the love and care into one film and and you know sometimes it's budgetary of course that's it's all about right. you know that that's also a factor but we're okay with. As long as it's, uh, you know, a prime release, I mean, I think of like Second Sight. Second Sight typically do like one a month, and yeah. it's usually like a, a banger, and it's like <laughs> the best. There's no reason to buy that movie again after you've bought their version of it. Like, Yeah, and I think, you know, the boot, what, one thing we've, I think, emphasized here on Chasing Labels, as well as I think other people have noticed that there is a uniqueness to the boutique label world when it comes to these releases. Like, these aren't just like, Let's pump out as many as we can. These are specifically catered to certain type of collectors, people who are paying attention to all of the details. Uh, they go over them at, as with a fine tooth comb, as they say. Um, yeah. So it's it's all it's great to see uh, for many people that we've interviewed here on Chasing Labels. Um, they start out as movie fans, movie collectors, so they know what to expect because it they're kind of making things that they would want to buy themselves mm -hmm. you know what i mean so they have the collecting mindset going into it so they know what to put into it right. which is which is great yeah sure. and so tom please tell us uh were you like a lawyer before this it was it something born <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah. I'd make a terrible lawyer um <laughs> so I, I yeah I, again i i was brought up with the tail end of the video boom myself. Uh, so fond memories of going to the video shop, but then my brother and myself, we were filmmakers and our first casts were our cuddly toys and we'd graduate to using friends and then actors. So I make feature films and short films nice, nice. of the, you know, the, of the B movie, no budget variety. <laughs> some of my, fa some of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love well, that. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it, it all feeds into uh, the same thing, doesn't it? Um, and I connected uh, with Graham on Facebook uh, because, you know, it transpired that we're both from the black country, which is the industrial heart of the West Midlands. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, that was quite cool. And then I realized and then Graham was telling me about what he was up to with um, his business film treasures, which was a, an e-commerce um, service that provides all the boutique labels to the to UK customers. You know, so we're talking you know, your Kinos and your Severins and your Vinegar Syndromes. So Graham saw a really good uh, gap in the market there to bring these amazing releases to UK shores. Uh, and he invited me to come and see him at his uh, unit in uh, Cradleave, which is in the heart of the black country. And I turned up, saw his stock on the shelves and was I was back in that video shop again, like as a, as a kid go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Graham told me his plans for the label and he told me to, uh, it, he's got the last hunter which was amazing to me and and then he told me about some further plans and subsequently poached me basically and then said you're coming to work for me <laughs> yeah. well to tom's being a bit modest there um because yeah, I'm, I'm gonna big him up now is that what what why i headhunted him was that he made um, an excellent short film called bella in the witch elm and we should just explain, because I'm sure there's a lot of Americans saying, where the hell is the black country? Um, it, it, we live in the, in, in the Midlands in the UK, and the, the black country is so cool because it used to be a big industrial area with coal mines and steelworks, and everything, therefore, was, uh, what, what, what's the saying? Uh, 
Black Bow Day, Red, Red Bow Night, or something some, like that. Yeah, yeah. so it was a big, so that therefore it's it's known locally as the, as the Black Country. Chain, um, chain makers. Yeah, and all that. We did uh, we, we did lots of things, production. So, but in terms of the horror world, um, we, 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 we're in a town called Dudley. Um, and Dudley, we have a famous director. You might have heard of him called James Whale, who did... Uh, oh, no. I don't know who that guy is. I don't know whether you heard this guy. He's not <laughs> really. um, but, yeah, he was, he was born in our hometown, and hardly anybody in Dudley knows that. So... We've got plans to sort of, you know, bring that up and, and pay homage to him because um, yeah, he, he was he was born and bred here before he went to the States. Um, so, yeah, that, that's our claim to fame. But Tom's a great indie filmmaker. Um, he's just finishing a film. I hope you don't mind saying it's good. No. Superstition, um, which was featuring Caroline Munro. Um, and I just saw this guy's skills and, um, you know, we had the same similar tastes and I thought, what a, what a great asset Tom would be. So um, so that's, that's I sort of said to him, look, I haven't got a lot of money, but if I can afford to pay you, will you come across, join us, and we'll try and make a go of this thing. And, it's a no-brainer. Uh, uh, and he said, yeah, thankfully. Yeah, it was a no-brainer. So yeah. here we are today. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So 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 do we – look, I know it's it seems a little maybe conceited, but where is there going to be a Tom Rudder uh, box set uh, <laughs> the, of, 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 the, of his shorts? coming because i mean i'd be interested maybe when i'm dead <laughs> I, I guess some sometimes people need to die first you know, you know. Yeah, but uh, when they see the light of day but that that's great man i i love that i love that uh uh there's you know people that understand filmmaking behind the scene i, I always think that's a, a an essential thing to to uh um you know even film fans in general i i mean i'm not saying you have to be uh, somebody that understands filmmaking to really appreciate movies but but I think it helps, you know, and it helps. It's also appreciating the lineage of um, where these labels come from. And for us yeah. to kind of, for Graham to be doing this in the black country is is a beautiful thing because, you know, you, you, you think of labels and you think of the, hot, the, the activity of distribution and yeah. of activity in general. You think of London, you think of London and the city, and we're out of the city, you know. Yeah. So this, is, this is what's exciting about it, you know. We yeah, I, I was going to say it sounds like you're essentially for the for the U.S. It would be like living in you know in the middle of our country, like living yeah. in o Ohio or, or you know or yeah. not Ohio or like Iowa, like Iowa yeah. or like Missouri, Probably, yeah. more like Midwest or just yeah. Western general. Um, Absolutely, the not. the Rust Belt as we call it. Yeah, um, so yeah. it's a very like industrial area yeah. with a, probably a rich history of blue collar working, really. Well, um, Dudley, going back to Dudley, it's actually Dudley had a significant label before, didn't it, Graham? Called yeah. uh, called Duran, and Duran mm -hmm. were uh, kind of really the forerunners of uh, uh, domestic Super Eight reels, and they made an exclusive deal with Disney to distribute Disney films on Super Eight back in the day. And they, oh, this wow. was one of the first companies Disney ever kind of farmed out to that weren't a Disney company, you know. So D Dudley's got a really rich history of uh, distribution there again, which nobody really picks up on much. No, not nowadays, no. You know. no, that's great. That's that's you're teaching us something because that's yeah, it's that's that's something I would have never known. But, well, you uh, know, this is a label that pops up uh, that, and then moves on to home video. And when you yeah. read like books on horror films and and for us like section three video nasties and whatnot, they released a good handful of those as well. So you know they were part of that fabric, but you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't have realized that they were so close to us, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Amazing so, where it all comes from. Oh yeah, definitely. It, well, it, sometimes a lot of a lot of the most interesting things in our hist history as people come from the smallest of places. You know, that places where there's not, you know, because there's people that are, you know, when you live in a small town or you live, you know, or you live in a place where there's not a lot of things going on other than you know industrial work. I think people have a lot of time for for creativeness, you know. So I think that that's. That's where and, and, and an unfiltered creativeness because maybe they're not exposed to so much of the outside world, so yeah. it, beco it becomes a lot more interesting. Things come out of there a lot more interesting and and. Uh, but I do want to get into your tastes, uh, yeah. uh, Tom. Let's talk about so, some of your inspiration for the films you make, or just in general your your favorite uh, kind of foundational favorite things that you like to watch. Well, everything and everything from SOV to um, you know British classics and whatnot. Yeah. So, also, um, really hardcore porn as well. <laughs> no. Hey, that, that's 
you know, vin- vinegar, si- vinegar syndrome really no sets us up for that. So. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. 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 No, you know, um, it's interesting, but that, you know, we it, it gets brought up here on the podcast a lot just because a lot of the boutique labels put them out. And it's all part of the cinematic history. Well, it you know, really it's all it's all part of it, you know. Well, especially when you consider when Vinegar Syndrome released Dracula Sucks and, uh, and then Massacre yeah. Video releases Hardcore and then this is a hardcore porn with gore and stuff in it. So. Yeah. But no, um, go, a lot of my films take their cues from silent cinema as, uh, right through to the 70s. So Hexen's a big favourite, which comes from the ages, not in 22. Uh, but then also films from the 1970s, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, everything. We're a broad church, you know, that's 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 kind of the... The, that's kind of the, what it's like to be a film fan, isn't it? A cinephile means they they watch everything without judgment, and I think that's what's so special about um, that's what's so special about horror fans is that um, uh, you get a lot of um, ci- um, cinephiles who kind of turn their nose up at horror and genre films, mm-hmm. whereas I feel that horror fans we come into cinema through horror, and we're therefore introduced from horror to world cinema, art house. And we've got a more kind of robust taste then, and we, we like to take in uh, all walks of cinema. Whereas I think, you know, you do get a lot of people turn their nose up it, which I just, I think is unfair, because I think horror is the great gateway drug to cinema, you know. I I, I can't agree more. And, and I, I mean, I think people, uh, they, they agree with that, even when they don't realize it, because uh, some of the most popular filmmakers right now, are introducing people through horror. They're introducing things to people through horror, like your Ari Aster's. It's horror, but it's not like straight up like horror. It's like yeah. dramatic, psychological, the psychological dramas. Uh, yeah. or, or somebody like Robert Eggers is doing something that's horror, but it's also like folklore. It's also like got mm-hmm. a history to it. It's got a, a richness to it that is something that you would typically see maybe in more art house cinema. But they're being introduced to it through horror. It's 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 so horror is a, a way to really get into so many different types of you know genre filmmaking um, just through its you know point of view. So Absolutely. yeah, horror, horror's been around in cinematic history you know since the silent era. It's been around for so long. I think you know I think of Nosferatu all the time cabinet of dr caligari you know Absolutely. you can go on and on go back from there i mean look at what george melier was doing with his special effects films a lot of those were like haunted houses ghosts the devils you know it's it's the, the, the moon with the moon watching you with a big exactly. smiling yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's been there right from the birth of cinema really definitely um graham please tell us th- some of your favorite you know foundational films that you're kind of got you into film Oh, goodness, I could be here all day. Um, typical ones are, I don't know. I mean, I love, as much, I like a gory film, but I like atmosphere more. Um, so, you know, if, I mean, I love, for example, the film The Exorcist. I think that's a great, oh, yeah. great yeah. film. A, you know, the, the atmosphere and the spiritual uh, showdown, uh, which was, you probably know, you guys, was, was effectively banned over here for many, yeah. many years. Um you know, and the things like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, great film, great film. Um, and, and it wasn't so long ago. I was telling Tom because Tom's 15 years younger than me and he's kind of missed all this. Uh, but I was telling him how, you know, in the in the old days that I had to phone up companies in the States and buy films. Uh, this was on VHS. And the guy would say uh, to me, hey, has these films a band in England? Would you like me to send them in playing covers? And I said, yes, please. I was really <laughs> grateful. But it's embarrassing that, the, you know, the situation with the whole video nasty thing, it's ridiculous now when you look back on it. But, um, you know, we've just got second sight release in Texas Chainsaw over here in 4K. I mean, you know, we used to we used to pass pirated VHSs around in the school playground. You know, it was, it was a naughty, rebellious thing to do. You know, have you seen this? And the, um, the, the, the quality, it would be 10th. Uh, on team generation recorded so the quality would be crap but yeah. you know you had something naughty and magical but you know to, people don't appreciate that unless you live that time to now go to oh, i bought second side 4k which is mint you know you got the whole dolby and everything people just don't realize what a contrast it was um but even like the, the last hunter 
Um, you know, that was. Um, are you guys aware of what we had here, like the video nasty thing? And yeah, you know, yeah. about yeah, okay. So uh, there was different. Like, you had with different lists, like sexual one, which was the real bad stuff. Yeah. Section two and three. So that, the last hunter was a section three video nasty at one time, yeah. which sounds ridiculous now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. So and, and we've got uh, we've got mausoleum coming up. We're working on that at the moment. Um, that again, another section three video nasty. Um, but um, yeah, it's um, my, my tastes are very varied. I, I love atmospheric films. You know, I like the Medusa touch. Richard Burton, who I think is a great actor, um, you know, I, I, I like the others, like you know, like Dawn of the Dead, the original one, and I like the remake as well. I thought that was quite good. Yeah, um, you know, but um, yeah, my taste is about Tom and I are both big horror fans, but we've got plans to do other things that aren't just horror, um, you know, and, and really it just comes down to the fact that do we like the film and do we think we could do a half decent job with it. Um, you know, it could be comedy um, if we like it. We're, we're not going to go down the line of, um, we, you know, you've got to have a Spanish section or a Hong Kong section because, well, A, you sort of pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into the fact that you, you will then release titles that you might not necessarily like, but you feel obliged to release. And plus the fact a lot of them have already been released anyway. Um, yeah. And, and companies have done a good job doing that. So, you know, it's really just, I don't know, a, a, if I can say a professional hobby, if that makes sense. You know, it's its its something born out of passion rather than the business. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't want to lose money. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, um, and and that's, that's a big thing because, you know, costs mount up, whether you, you, you buy the licensing rights and then you have a new scan done. Um, and the big bugbear for us is the BBFC. That really annoys us because, you know, you're talking to get a feature film uh, class certified, it's about a thousand pounds over it. It's mm. a lot of money. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a rip off, frankly. I was just talking about the BBFC, our beloved BBFC. Oh, yeah. And because yeah. um, you guys have the MPAA over there, but yeah. a, lot, a lot of um, people like, uh, like David Gregory from Severin. You know, he, he got so fed up with this, and he, he, he obviously in the States, he doesn't have that trouble. Because um, you can release things unrated over there with the most deluxe editions, and you can cram them full of features. And whereas over here, everything has to be rated. Yeah, everything, wow. even, a, even a moving menu, has to be rated. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. I know, I know, I've always been aware that on the cover of every single Blu ray or DVD, there's always been the ratings plastered on the cover which is a lot different than here i mean you wouldn't even know what our movies are in because they're in very small print on the back bottom <laughs> of all of our releases whereas in the uk everything is front and center you know well, show, showing where it is it's funny because a lot of the boutique labels over here now are hiding them a lot more mm. yeah. so on, on the hard boxes and stuff like that you you just won't see them you'd see one maybe that has to be shown in shops really and stuff like this but I think they are just hiding them more so now. And yeah. They're getting more creative, yeah, like, like, you know, like, Radiance. They're making, making them smaller. I know that's that. It, yeah. Well, yeah. well, that and, and, like, Radiance uses the strip that can be removed yes. or, fl yeah. or flipped or, you, you know, sometimes they're putting them on the bottom oh, um, yeah. or sometimes they're um, putting them on the uh, the throwaway, you know, you know, wrap that's on yeah. the outside yeah. and then it yeah. can be pulled off. And then, well, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, that can be removed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they see the 101s here, that's a sticker. And yeah. Yeah. You, you won't see it on the spine either, so it's not on the spine. Yeah. And then obviously there's one at the back because then I suppose that's the you know the legal requirements. But yeah, it just I think it's quite an outdated model now, really. I mean, especially now we're in the age of streaming as well, and a lot of people consume uh, TV and film through streaming. And how is that being regulated? You know, it, it's just it's 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 it, 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 probably not very much it, and, and as it should no. be it should be only regulated by the parents and the, the people yeah, that are the deciding to watch it that's how it should be i guess exactly i, I mean you, you know there's nothing stopping you from putting a warning of the, the content of a film sure yeah. 
But to pay this much money to get a little sticker on there telling you the age rating it's recommended to, <laughs> or supposedly you know, it's meant to be for. Do you do you think that's more for like to cover retailers or for like retailers to way they they can sell the movie to certain audiences and stuff like that? Um, I think it's I think it's a reason for them to make money. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, mean, I think that's what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a business. I mean, I've got two kids, well, they're all seventeen and fifteen. But you know, I've always put it down to parental responsibility. You know, exactly. I, I I know. My, my my daughter, she's fine with a Halloween film at 13, 14, even though it says 18. No, I couldn't take her to the cinema, the theatre, to show it because she wouldn't pass for that age. But, you know, that's my decision to show it at home. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, a a £1,000, but it's too much. You know, if it was a £100 or £200, then fine. You know, you could get it certified and... The, the, the viewer can be made aware of the content and then they can make the decision whether to show it or not. But I, it's really, you know, it's really hurting the, the physical media industry, certainly. And let's face it, we all watched these films when we probably shouldn't have done, you know, so <laughs> so it was it kind of didn't work. Really, as, didn't. as you mentioned the horror genre, a lot of the people we've interviewed uh, were, you know, started off as horror fans and a lot of them started off very, very young watching like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, when they were like three, four years old. And it's like, it's that young, you know? Yeah. I mean, my parents would uh, threaten us with saying, like, you know, we'll put this film on for you and it's going to scare you that much. You won't want them to watch another one. <laughs> and obviously that backfired, really. <laughs> give, me, give me more. Yeah, severely. <laughs> my, my, my young 10-month-old has already watched, like, things that no kid that young should watch like <laughs> just because she's in the room and i'm just like i'm sorry this is what this is what you got to watch you have to watch on. this you have to watch this you know rather than warping people's minds as the papers have tried to tell us in the past um it's actually like um in influencing creativity you know it's inspiring yeah. it's inspiring creativity it's showing creativity it's proactive it's not um you know it's it's not damaging it's it's uh well, I mean, there are certain films out there which might uh, contradict that, but <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, there's certain things I don't want to necessarily show her, but like, it's like I think if you're talking about a, a real legitimate uh, scarring of somebody uh, when it comes to watching something like this on a film, like it, I think it has to be repetitively watched for it to really have an effect. You know what I mean? Like, if I show my daughter Nightmare on Elm Street, like five times a day for the next month. Yeah. It's going to fuck her up probably. But <laughs> not if she watches it in passing for one time, you know, like it's not, it's not torture or anything. It's, yeah. we're not, you know, we're not torturing our kids, you know, but it's, it's, you know, like you said, create, I think, it, I think watching certain types of film can, can inspire cr creativity and curiosity more than anything. It, yeah. make them, them curious and they'll ask questions and we can tell them like, this is just all make believe. And somebody made this up and it's, I know it's it's weird, you know, and sometimes kids love things that, are, you know, that you shouldn't be it, just like us as adults. We can like something that you shouldn't be laughing at or you're, you're not, you know, just because yeah. we're, we're weird. People oh, are yeah. weird. I, I bring you up know? American Psycho all the time. Mm -hmm. American Psycho is so ridiculously absurd in its violence that you sometimes cannot help but laugh at the absurdity in it. Of how oh, it's yeah, ridiculous. Awesome. I was just as psychologically damaged by the never-ending story than I was the Evil Dead, and they're both fantasies, you know. That's Very true. Yeah. Very true. Uh, Some it, things that are supposed to be for kids actually end up being pretty. Oh yeah, pretty I, weird. I, I, that more I always used to find it disturbing how Jaws over here was a PG, and then you'd get like a knockoff like Piranha, which was like an eighteen, and I'm thinking, what's the difference here? Because Jaws is actually quite gory and quite terrifying. So yeah. what was the difference? Other yeah. than, uh... In fact, you've, you've just reminded me. The only thing I've ever turned away, any time I've ever turned away from the screen was when we, my, my mom took me to see um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so what was this, 80, 83? 80, 80, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I had been about 10 years old. And you know when they open the whole scene where they, they're ready to finally open the Ark and have the ceremony? And when the, the 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 angels come out and the guy's face starts to really melt and stuff, you know, even to this day, I can't believe that got passed as a PG. No, it's insane. So, you know, I, I mean, you know, they talk about video nasties and gores. You got a guy on fire, people exploding, the guy 
I mean, it, it's not just a second. It's it's a whole two or three seconds where, and it's the yeah. only time I turned it's, away. Basically, it's Spielberg cool. always gets a free pass through. I was going to yeah. say it's Spielberg. That's why. That's why. <laughs> Ironically, it was. If you did the yeah, same I, effects I, on the minuscule budget, then they'd give you an eighteen. You know. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Ironically, it was his the sequel to uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, which created the PG thirteen rating yeah, because yeah. it was so. I guess it pushed the envelope too much. Although yeah. you had PG films before then that you could argue were more like gory, probably yeah. form more gory than Temple of Doom. Maybe then PAA just finally like had enough. Who knows? <laughs> and they're like, hey, let's just create this PG thirteen and just yeah. whatever. Yeah, um, Which I know. I twelve in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was seeing PG thirteen films when I was, of course, under thirteen, and I didn't. I couldn't even like tell the difference between PG and PG thirteen. I was so young at the time, but I was even saying like there are some animated films which which are always associated with young people, children uh, that are traumatizing. A lot of the stuff that was done in the eighties, I think, is very traumatizing. Things like Land Before Time, American yeah. Tale. Um, I even think of the All Dogs Trump Go to Heaven. Trump. All those Don, those Don Bluth '80s animated films were just like traumatizing for children. What was that? What was that one? Uh, was it like My Little Toaster or something? Or what was that? Oh, Brave Little Toaster. Yeah. Yeah. The one that was Toy Story before Toy Story. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> with the that, with, my, my wife that. showed me that movie for the first time, and I was like. This this movie's fucked up. Yeah, well, I, I mean, watched that like... when I was a little kid, <laughs> and it was it was traumatizing. I refused to watch the Plague Dogs. I, I as an adult now, I refuse to watch the Plague Dogs and Watership Down. That can, Watership Down. That can yeah. just oh, yeah. can just get out of my face as well. <laughs> I just I just watched Watership Down. I think for the podcast within the last two years for the first time. I think. I don't know if BFI was putting it out or something. Is that well, they were they were going to put it out and it got canceled. But oh, is that Criter what Criterion put it out. So. Criterion put it out way before then. And uh, yeah. one year they they aired it on TV uh, for Easter, and it ended up traumatizing a bunch of kids here because <laughs> they obviously whoever put it on didn't realize that it's Watership Down and not like Peter Cottontail or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like the parents got all mad. Oops. And I'm like, I, I guess that's what happens. Yeah. No, it's strange. It really is. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, a bit of dark fantasy is really good for a kid's imagination. But you look at some of those films and you think, what were they thinking? You know? <laughs> well, I think I think it was that they wanted to they wanted to do what we, what we, what we're actually praising here, which is you know, spark some creativity, and make you think Absolutely. about what you're watching. Yeah, and, 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 and you it, know, it's, it was it was a different time in cinema mm -hmm. than it is now. You know, it's the Things were commercialized, of course, as they always are. But now the commercialization of movies, especially geared towards certain demographics, is way more emphasized now than ever before. Like they purposely manufacture certain films to appeal to certain audiences yeah. to make money. I mean, it's, it's always been there, but now it's more obvious. It's yeah. more obvious, way more obvious. Um, but with more whitewashing than ever before. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we gotta have that. Um, but uh, but it's uh, let's get back into uh, the last hunter, uh, your release. Uh, tell us tell us about some of the uh, work that was done, um, getting the you know deciding on like the packaging and and the features, getting the features together, or even like, the, deciding the, on the last hunter, like why yeah, specifically this movie? Yeah, because it, it's a it's a fantastic package. I mean, you have tons of you have. And I don't I don't know how much of it was all produced by you guys. I know you produced some of the uh, some of the features. I know the the big one that's um, on here. I believe was already made prior by the uh, filmmaker's son. I believe. Um, yeah, the outside of the documentary. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I basically, you know, when you start here, you you, you certainly go up to the next level and you think well i'm a collector and I, I know what i like to see in a film and in a package but then you've actually got to put that into practice um so you're sort of fumbling around trying to find out who owns the rights to what um and um i actually it was jesse i'll always big jesse up because he's been a great help for it for treasured films um you know and, and obviously he sort of a year or two ahead of us and he's got the experience and so he said talk talk to these people in italy um and i sort of got a list of avails was really surprised as i said before to find that the last time's available 
um, and I liked it. And I th you know, you start thinking, well, what can we do there for special features and essays and all this? Okay, um, so we we managed to get the rights for five years, um, and then took a scan and a restoration, um, and you know that turned out to be mint. So I'm really pleased with that. Um, so it wasn't cheap, but um, it's well worth it. I feel. Um, Eugenio Eccoloni, have you spoke to him yet? Who? Eugenio Eccoloni, he, he's an Italian no. guy. He, he he produces a lot of the extras, uh, Italian extras for the labels. Uh, no, you, should, yeah, okay. you should talk to him. He's, he's, he works for all the labels, you know. He's, um, he's a nice guy, very helpful, very professional. Awesome. Very uh, prolific. Yeah, very prolific. Um, and so, you know, I sort of had a meeting with him and said, look, I've got some ideas. Um, because um, I, I sort of was thinking, um, oh, I forget her name. Who's, who's the lady in the Last Hunter, the photographer? Uh, Tisa Farrow. Thank you. I said, yeah, let, let, let's, uh, let's get her to do something, you know, and we can call it Who's She? Because that's the first line David Warback says when he meets her. Uh, and Eugenia said, Graham, you have to stop here because uh, she doesn't give interviews anymore. Um, you know, and so many people have tried to get her to, to do an interview. So you, you have all these great ideas and they're, they're certainly scuppered. Um, but Eugenio came up with some great ideas. He said, look, we could speak to this person, that person. And I thought, great. Um, and he said, oh, by the way, there's a documentary that's never had um, an English friendly release called The Outsider. Um, would you be interested in that? I think it would go well. With the film and uh, yeah it's a great documentary um yeah. again it wasn't cheap um but it's it's great and now i think severin have picked it up for one of their releases margarita releases yeah um but yeah it's it, it never had an english friendly release so we picked it up and uh, we did that and then i asked people like graham humphreys um it, it's just great art for a lot of these packages would you be interested in this film? And he said, sure, uh, I've never heard of it. What can I see? <laughs> um, and so um, so I sent it to him and um, he said, great, it's got Bobby Rhodes in it. It's a great film. I love this film. Um, so, he, yeah, he, he produced some wonderful art. I was really chuffed with that. Um, and then we got Troy Howarth and Nathaniel Thompson to do the audio commentary and they're great guys. They've been really helpful. Um, and then the essays we did, we did, um, you know, sort of filmography or Italian filmography and David Warbeck, uh, which I think is, is very comprehensive and complete now. So that should be a, a good point of reference for collectors. Um, I thought that was a nice touch that you did that because uh, it's I think that's how us as collectors sometimes collect is we look at actors and we like you know, we like this movie that we have and we're like, what else is similar to this or what, what else is in that in that wheelhouse uh, yeah. that relates to the actors or the filmmakers? And it's like, oh, well, here now you have a list right here in the in the booklet of like other films maybe that you'd be interested in. Uh, yeah. I thought that was that was a great touch doing that. So, yeah, and I, I, I actually asked um, John Martin, who's um, he, he's an author and he, he does uh, he works for the Dark Side magazine sometime over here. Um, if you've got anything historic with David Ar uh, David Warbeck, so we can just, you know, we can include it as a, as a nice touch. And he got a nice archival interview we did with him, um, which I thought was was really good. And it, it finishes off the booklet completely as a, as a tribute to David. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's um, it can be stressful at times when you're curating these things, you know. It's money and will this look good and will that look good and... Um, I guess to some extent you, you sort of, you led, um, because not all releases are going to have this because A, there's a, there's a reality of a commercial decision here. You know, if you're putting so much money in, will you get the return back? You know, even just to cover your costs, let alone make money. Um, so, you know, not a lot of the releases have that pedigree, that history, those materials available. Um, so, I mean, that's been a topic of discussion back and forth between Tom and myself about whether we're going to do the same for this release and that release. Um, and some are more obvious that they'll lend themselves to that way. And some will be, you know, we'll, we'll always do good packages, slips and booklets, um, but they won't be 
sort of uh, the the bells and whistles packages that the last hunter was. But um, yeah, I I think last hunter is pretty good. I, I'm I'm chuffed with it. I mean, meeting Graham, it was uh, he made it clear from the start that he didn't want to fill his discs up with just filler. You know, he wanted all these extras to to be worthwhile, really. You yeah. know. Uh, because we are in an age now where consumers want more for their book, but we don't want to just give them more for the sake of it, you know. Yeah. And we want the films to be able to dictate the package that they come with as well. And like Graham said, The Last Hunter deserved a majestic kind of release because of all the history that surrounds uh, Italian films around that time and of the stars and the director mm-hmm. and of the type of film that it, that it is. Whereas other films might not have, uh, necessarily uh, require that sort of package, sure. you know. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, and that's, you know, like you said, it, it, the filmmaker behind this film uh, required the, the 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 need to 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 build it up more and uh, have that support with everything included. And I do want to take a closer look at the booklet here. Uh, I One of the main things that's always important about something like this is the material it's used to be to be made with. Very, very thick, you know kind of cardboard it's not like a a, like it's not like a hardback book but the booklet material itself very thick outer pages so it's not easily bent it's not it's really well done guys um yeah it's also it is it is a 60 page book so we're talking legitimate yeah it's pages here good stuff a lot of Mm. writing material not filled up with just it's not a picture book Mm. you know it's it's got a lot of writing with yeah, got a lot of writing material. Really yeah. All guns blazing with that one, didn't you? Really? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's um, yeah, the book's great, and it does have some great images in it as well. Um, of course. Yeah, uh, but I think you know, I, again, it's it's not that we can think we can do better than anybody. It's just what we want to see in the release, and uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I want to read something critical um, about the film. Give me some information. You know, give me some questions to think about. Give me some humour. That kind of that you think it's worth reading rather than worth plodding through, um, because in my opinion, there's there's a lot of filler out there. Um, and I guess I, I guess it's a taste thing, but you know, I, if if I'm reading something or if I'm watching um, an interview being filmed, uh, you know, I saw somebody being filmed. I, I'm not interested in somebody telling me, oh, I remember that it was a Wednesday and it was cold and it was raining. You know, I, it doesn't it doesn't relate to me. You know, I, tell me about the film. Get, let, me, let me appreciate it more. That kind of thing. So, uh, also, for a film like this, um, people may not be aware of it. Like, I didn't, I had never heard of it until you guys released it. So, right. like, I've only heard of this movie within the last couple of months. So wow. to get all of the extra stuff around it to give the movie context, like the making of, like the people involved firsthand in the making of the movie or or over in the movie, and then of course the essays in it reflecting on the movie, it creates this kind of, I don't want to be too snooty here, but saying this educational package presenting this movie in a way that it's probably never been presented before to people. Because when you look at it, if you just look casually look up the film, oh, it's you know, an Italian, you know, Vietnam exploitation film from the early 80s. But that's really not, that's just a log line of what it is. It's not the entire picture. You know, you have to put yourself in the context of the time. It's coming out in the post-Vietnam era, the post-Vietnam generation. It's coming out uh, in the aftermath of the success of The Deer Hunter. So it, it's taking influence from that, but trying not to be as political, but also trying to be its own thing. But you can see the similarities to the point where, is it wasn't the movie like like wasn't it almost got pitched like a sequel to the Dare Hunter or connected to the Dare Hunter? I think yeah. in Italy, yeah. and where they had the same like Italian title for the film. Yeah, they they, they had it, and um, it was going to be called um, Cacciatore Two, <laughs> and they were basically told that if you do that, I think they had some posters made, but they were told if you go ahead with that, we're, we're going to sue you. Um, so, <laughs> Not a uh, surprise. Yeah, um, the influence are there, the Deer Hunter, uh, great film, Apocalypse Now, great film. Um, but I, I, I think what's interesting in, in looking at these things, you think, well, are they just Italian rips or do they have something to offer, you know, in their own merits? And I think they do. 
um, you know, it's um, I, 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 I think it's a good film. It's it's an action film. It's got gore. You, you care about the characters, you know, um, and it doesn't go on too long either. You know, it's over. But um, well, exploitation films have always open their own discussions haven't they yeah and this is no different yeah know. yeah and uh, talking about content we unfortunately we lost john steiner poor man he died in a, in a road uh, car accident about three days before we were due to interview mm. um and wow. we lost him uh, yeah and uh, poor man i think i think he was in his 80s but you know um Eugenio had a, all, all the interview lined up and so he found me and said, have you heard? And I, I had by then. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the whole the thing where he plays his part and, and sends one of his uh, guys off to go and grab the coconut. I mean, that's, that's something that, <laughs> that scene, you know, and he's, you, you have to avoid all these explosions and these bullets, but I want coconut. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was a fun scene. There. It, it really tells you about the, the psychological place that these people were in during the war i mean even though this is an exploitation film some of that stuff is a is real stuff like people yeah. needed to find ways to you know get you know they were get by with the time uh you know uh kind of uh you know deal with their their surroundings being in such high pressure situations they put themselves in high pressure situations to to have fun you know and i'm sure you know we know there's a lot of horror stories from from our time over there, yeah. bad things that happened. Sure. So it, it, other than the normal, just the war itself, but like it's, mm. yeah, it shows you the, the mindset of people that were there. And, and I think what's interesting about, uh, you know, Italian kind of rip, if you want to call it that movies, if you want to consider this, one of them is that, like you said, you're looking at another culture, looking at our, you know, another culture and then putting their kind of their out, outsider spin on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, it really creates a, a a new a new kind of thing. I mean, it's it's not straight from the horse's mouth. It's it's well, look what they did with the western. You know, the, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The they, Italian, they, the, they, the spaghetti they, western changed the genre as <laughs> as we know it and became one of the most popular, I think, western genres. You know, is mm -hmm. the spaghetti western. Other than the the you know, when people talk about westerns, they don't typically like to go back and say, "Oh, John Wayne movies are my favorite." You know, it's mostly they like the Clint Eastwood movies. They like, you know, they like that more harder edge stuff compared, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of examples where the Italian kind of ripoff versions end up being the more, you know, more popular versions of that genre. So, yeah, I mean, it's it because the, in a way, because, you know, the slicker, more easily digestible. Like if you compare this, you know, to Apocalypse Now, completely different, totally different films. I mean, they've you tried know, part of it is just so they're so there's a lot of them are just so morally dubious. You don't know where they're sat morally, you know, and that creates for more exciting viewing. You're not quite sure what the perspective is, and it, that's that can again opens further discussion, you know. But you just really don't know where they're coming from sometimes, other than just giving you the the ingredients to a film that they think that you want, you know. Yeah. And and sometimes a, I think it's like a un, un, unabashed, like, like uh, maybe in a sense, uh, for a better word, a, an ignorance too, because maybe some of the things that uh, the original movie would have stayed away from because of maybe hoping somebody wouldn't get upset about it, they don't care because it's not maybe <laughs> the, their problem. You know, it's not their, you know. So they, excuse me, I got snot going down my throat right now. Oh, yeah. I've been sick. You so. didn't have to say that, but okay. yeah, I know. My bad. <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh I, well I, you know we're being honest on here i didn't want you guys to think i was just going to start coughing on on the air uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean that's one of the things too is there's this somewhat of an ignorance because it's like they you know whatever problems the original filmmakers had they don't have them same it's no, they really did not give yeah. a fuck most of the time the italians that's what that's why we love the film so much they're just so in your face yeah they're police films you know they're they're police films that you know like yeah. they're some of that shit's hardcore you're like he just killed all them people like they wouldn't have done that in american cinema you know they wouldn't have killed a group of people you know or, you know on screen and showed it and like you know yeah so it's 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 definitely an important genre uh, that I think I think there that you're seeing a lot more labels exploiting that genre a little bit more. Oh I yeah, see, I, arrows, but arrows put out a lot of Italian a lot of Italian kind of. like westerns, spaghetti westerns that yeah. aren't Sergio Leone. A lot of other ones that probably people haven't seen or aren't aware of, and if they are, they haven't been in great condition, you know, for people to be seen or whatever the case may be. 
some of those are, are masterpieces as well. You know, it's just it's yeah. Just how was yeah, how was the condition of the last hunter when you guys first got the initial materials? Was did it need a, an extensive restoration? Well, to be honest, we don't know because um, when we did the licensing, we were we were given the option: do you just want to scan as it is? Or do you want a scan and a restoration? And I thought, well, you know, nowadays to, to really um, be con taken seriously, I guess, uh, if you want to put it that way, you, you, you really, you, if you've got money, if it goes anywhere, it's got to go into the film itself, right? Before you start thinking about extras and packaging and all this. Because there's no point putting out a fancy edition if the master's crap. So... That I just said right from the start. The only the only decision I had to make was, did I want a two K restoration or a four K? And and honestly, I couldn't afford a four K. This is how tight things were. But then we've discussed this since. I mean, it looks great, and it does. That, that then raises the question: Well, does a film necessarily need a four K if you're not going to release it on UHD? You know, and. You know, I, I mean, I, I like 4K UHD. I have some films, and so and some of that works better on, on more different films than others. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't regret not doing that. You know, it's I, I think the film looks. I think it looks, without wishing to sound too immodest, the best it's ever looked. Um, you know, and I think I think with the package and everything, I think it'll take something to to beat that. To be honest. Um, but yeah, again, it's all it all comes down to the passion, you know, put where you're going to put your money, taking your time on getting it right, curating, and rather than knock out a plethora of films every month, you know, you want to make sure you do it properly, you're satisfied, you, you've QC'd it, which yeah. seems to oh, that's very important. Be yeah. an issue for some labels at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't because the moment I say that, we'll, we'll release something bad. But, um, <laughs> um, but you know, you, you've got to just just take your time. Don't feel under pressure getting these out. Um, you know, we've just we've just finished the master on our next release, which is Jeff Lieberman says Little Helper, um, and we've got uh, we've got a nice sleep and a nice booklet for that. And again, we've just took our time, go back and forth between different people and say, yeah, we like this. Can you change that? You know, and just enjoy it. You know, it, it shouldn't be a pressurizing product of a business. It should be something that you put your heart and soul in, soul in if that doesn't sound too pretentious. Um, of course not. No. Uh, uh, please tell us a little bit more about Santa's Little Helper and why that was uh, chosen as your as your next release, if you can. Well, you know, we put so much thought into our next title, did with Tom? And yeah. uh, no, actually, um, we again. This is this is inexperience. We, I'd always assumed it'd be an, another Italian film, but then Jesse from Diabolic said, "Look, Jeff Lieberman's looking for a UK distributor. Would you be interested in?" I knew knew of Jeff Lieberman, of course, but I didn't know of that film. So I watched it and I thought, hey, this is really great. You know, it's got that, that Jeff Lieberman sort of twist and uh, the humour and the darkness. And I thought, yeah, I like this. Uh, and and I, was, I was emailing Jeff and he's a, he's a nice guy. He's been really supportive. Um, and so we worked out a deal then. I, you know, I said to him, look, I haven't got a lot of money. Would you consider this? Uh, and he said, yeah. So... Um, so we went to that. So, but we're, we're really pleased with that. But again, that, that was opportunity. It wasn't something we sat down and planned. You know, there's no schedule. We haven't got, we haven't got a year's worth of titles that but we're going to release this in June, this in August. You know, it doesn't work like that. Um, we've, we've, we have got some films that we've signed up for. Um, so we know roughly what the next schedule is going to be. Uh, but yeah, Sound of the Health is a great little film. Um, and um, it all goes back to that source in the extras thing. So you sometimes look at your two titles and you think, well, well we're nearly finished on this chunk here, but then this one's starting to take precedent now. So they're kind of racing to the, to the bite. And then you have to sit back and think, right, it's probably best that we put this one out next. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes yeah. it's a, a timetable thing that, yeah, that you can't, you're like, well, shit. 
we only signed up for five years. We need to make sure we get this one done. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the time is ticking as well. So yeah, you, you've yeah. got to take that into consideration. Mm, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, getting close to wrapping this up, uh, we, we did talk a little bit about your, your collecting, uh, please, uh, you, you talk about having a video store, uh, so that that's kind of cheating. You know, you have a whole store, uh, you know, that, you know, that makes you like the super collector, but, uh, tell us like where you are with, with how you collect and, 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 uh, are you blind buyers? Are you, are you, uh, you know, you only kind of pick things that you, you're familiar with. What's the habits like? Uh, Tom, over to you. Well, um, I think, uh, yeah, back in the day, I was a complete blind buyer. Everything I could see on VHS that had a painted cover and looked enticing enough that was a horror film or whatever. And obviously, as life gets busier, you don't get to watch as much. But then physical media is alive more than ever. So uh, as Graham mentioned earlier, the, the watch pile just gets higher and higher. The additions become better and better. But um yeah, you do find yourself going down little avenues, and I, I'm speaking as a filmmaker, so like different waves of inspiration come over me. So there's one, you know, f for a while I can just be obsessed with silent films, so then that's all I'll collect and watch. But then I'll just get a, I'll get the bug back for my Hammer Horror films again, for instance. So I'll just keep, I'll start watching and collecting Hammer Horror, and I think we all just fall down these little rabbit holes now and again, where we just kind of focus on. Um, I'm not particularly a label collector per se, because I know that a lot of people these days are label collectors. Um, you see all their vinegar syndromes lined up together with the slips, and don't get me wrong, they look absolutely beautiful. But then you find that a lot of these people watch these vinegar syndrome releases and think, wow, that was an awful film. Who wants to buy this off of me? You know, because yeah. uh, they buy it because they want to trust in the label. And we've said this previously as well, a lot of people do put their trust in labels. And that's something we've got to formulate ourselves now, really. Is yeah. And I think by releasing the uh, settings that they'll put uh, next, we're showing that we're not pigeonholed to one type of film. Exactly. And that reflects our collector collecting the way we collect films as well, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, I mean, I, I've been a collector, as I say, for many, many years. And uh, I, I did used to be a fanboy of certain labels. Um, uh, but then, you know, you have to keep reminding yourself it's about the film. Okay? The film comes first before anything else, before the label. And, and, you know, it makes me laugh sometimes when a label announces something and you get all these entitled angry people that, oh, I don't like this film. Why are you releasing it? And you just think, well, hey, <laughs> we've all got different tastes. It's fine. If you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. Move <laughs> on. You know, nobody, nobody's forcing you to buy this movie. Um but yeah, I, I, as Tom said, the, the problem is with, with the to watch pile, I've, I've got so much. And when you when you come home from work, you look at it and you think, you know, I've got to get through this. Not what can I watch next, great. It's just a stress. And my kids even tease me and say, look, Dad, you've only started this business so you can buy more tiles at wholesale prices. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, that's what, that's I, what I get to, told. That's I what I get to, told. To, that's what I get told about the podcast is I only started the podcast so that it gives me a reason to like collect more or even get some like, <clears throat> you know, free copies from some of these, uh, these labels for review. It's a, it's the only reason I started this podcast. Yeah, clearly, that, you know? clearly. Yeah. Um, not, not for the, not for the love of the game. Clearly. Um, yeah. it, what's interesting is that you mentioned that it, there are a lot of people who are very gatekeepy when it comes to certain labels can only release certain types of movies or that's not, Oh, that's not what they typically release. What are they doing? And it's like, just wait. They're going to release something else the tomorrow, or yeah. you know what I mean. Like the next month, something there's going to be a whole new wave of movies, or oh, yeah. there's going to be another company in a couple of days that's going to announce their stuff. That's exactly. the way it's going right now, really. Well, that we're tapping into something that people are extremely passionate about, and uh, passion does breed certain peculiar behaviors sometimes. And we're learning that just by um, doing what we do, really. <laughs> oh, right. Look, I, I mean, I've had emails from people say, why are you using this critic? You know, I, I don't like them. It's like, oh, okay, mate, I'll, I'll not use this guy because, you know, I, I, I've got to produce 2,000 copies but because you don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, won't, I won't use this critic or this person. You know, it's like... it's you, know, it, you can't satisfy it's petty, everyone. Man. It's petty, It's petty. Yeah. yeah, you can never really satisfy everyone. So you get to the point where you're just trying to 
you probably you're just trying to make the best product you can or the best release you can. Yeah. Um, regardless, you know, like you said, it does all start with the movie, and that's and not every movie is for everyone. You know, movies are as subjective as you can get. Um, yeah. so that's gonna already turn people off or turn people on based off of that basic fact. Yeah. Um, and you know, that the idea that a certain label has to be locked into certain things, I think yeah. is kind of silly. Because it, it, I don't like to box things into certain things because it, 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 it's too oppressive. And movies shouldn't be oppressive in any way. Movies should be open and free in its expression, in everything, in all of its aspects. It, it really shouldn't put those things in boxes. Granted, certain labels do release certain types of movies. That's their thing. Well, I, you know? I think that I think some some people that start labels feel the need to yeah. fill a hole. So that they decide that they're only gonna they're only gonna you know put out a certain type of film and they think that that will help fill a fill a niche in the market. Yeah, but when, I don't when think... on, honestly you then then the really I think the identity of of a label should just be organic. I, I don't yeah, know that like you have you, to necessarily. Like we've brought up you know. we've, we've brought up vinegar syndrome. Vinegar syndrome for years was putting out very very niche you know horror films that no one's really heard of or hasn't seen the light of day since the VHS era. And then now they're putting out things like Showgirls and yeah. and uh, and Roadhouse yeah. and it's and then so they're not allowed to do that because they've been because they started out the other way. No, they can do whatever they want. They they they're a company, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I think yeah, you, you have to come into this game with a certain philosophy. But then the way the the way the the way the wind takes you sometimes is they're down different avenues where you think actually why not you know and and that looks like what happened with the likes of Vinegar Syndrome releasing. Uh, films that you wouldn't expect from them, but it's just all in additions that people. I was guessing because a lot of studios don't really care for this physical media game, so you know the likes of it, I guess, you know, will, will will put that film out for them, but yeah. in an addition that everyone wants to see. So it's all down to like the love, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I, well, I, you're seeing. I mean, we're. I know me and Andrew are going to talk about this in a couple of days, but. Just you see, like Criterion's now, uh, you know, opened up to Janus Films doing this contemporary line now. So that you're seeing that there, there's a need where they see, you know, because they've been doing a lot of restructuring over there um, to make sure that they're being cur more current, you know. So they're like getting into more contemporary films instead of, you know, being kind of that label that's labeled as, you know, classic films and foreign films and like. They're trying to trying to say stay as relevant as possible by yeah. opening up their catalog to a lot more movies. It's so very it's, interesting yeah. because they they've kind of been beaten at their own game in many respects by a lot of these yeah. other fledgling labels. But these are also labels again going back to that 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 area of snobbery that we were talking about. People that turn their nose up at genre pieces. Yeah. Uh, these are the genre labels that are now also releasing the classics as well. You know, so they're just yeah. showing how robust they are in their tastes. Whereas criteria, they've always kind of thought, well, you know, they're not going to touch this and that and the other. But they've also been beaten on packaging and, and, and extras. And it, it, they were the label at one point, weren't they? They were like the label that I could never afford to buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody still buys, I think, a lot of their stuff through their sales uh, as long as they keep happening. But it's, yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think. Um, they're, they, they, I think they sensed that, that there needed to be some change, and I think unfortunately yeah. people lost their jobs during that change. But it's right. and, and it, they've it, they've been trying to make waves by putting out more contemporary movies. Like you've seen them put yeah. out um, one like, false move and like triangular sadness. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, even really current films like that. Yeah, I was gonna um, say even like The Irishman, Martin Scorsese stuff. You know, get the uh -huh. name, get the name recognition, Martin Scorsese plus the contemporary. Movie. Oh, uh, Wally, yep. Wall Wally. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Wally, yeah, literally yeah. Disney. You know, it, it's like they've been trying to make that push to to stick with their catalog stuff, but put out some modern stuff. Then now teaming up with Janice to put out kind of modern like indie stuff that you would see at film festivals and things like that yeah. or stuff that's streaming on their, their, um their platform, the criterion channel to get more eyes on there. And uh, you know what I mean? It is all about a balancing when it comes to right now, I think physical media plus the streaming world is in a crossroads. Mm -hmm. Is that a crossroads right now where streaming is, is changing quick right now The the bubble has shrunk. The platforms are changing networks and stupid time studios aren't making the money they they thought they were going to make so now things are shifting back to now they're making sure they back put to ads, where, ads on everything <laughs> where physical media is becoming more relevant 
because you just saw today, or, or you know, today as when we're recording this, Disney is shrinking down. Disney, the the ultimate big time corporate machine, Disney is not immune to this. They're going to shrink down, and they're going to be taking content off of their platform. Yeah. That content, where's it going to go? Is it going to be on someplace else? Well, it's but it, again, it? yeah, but if you have the physical media version of it, of the movie, TV show, whatever it is, you're good. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. they can't take it from you. And it doesn't take up space on their servers. <laughs> yeah. You know and I mean, it's, like it's, it, we saw that yeah. with with Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, yeah. another big time century old studio getting rid of their content on their streaming platforms. Um, so it's it, everything's kind of at a crossroads right now. So we're seeing that that the boutique labels that have been around for several years are kind of keeping uh, a lot of the movies around. And now. The bigger companies may have to turn back to physical media to mm -hmm. preserve their catalogs, really, because they don't know what to do with them because they've kind of exhausted, yeah. I guess, the money making when it comes to streaming. It would be interesting to see what happens with Warners because they are particularly picky about, well, they won't even sub license their films, will they? We, we, we try to get Blue Sunshine because, um, uh, you know, 4K and Jeff Lieberman said, look, if you, if you can get it, then. Uh, we can do a deal probably but i mean they're just you email you tweet your facebook message they don't come back to you and they've got their archive collection which again a lot of that's print on demand i'm guessing it's bare bones, if yeah. people make enough noise and they release a nice blu-ray on an archive edition but for the most part these films are locked away and it's like well what are you, what are you guys going to do with these films? Yeah. i've heard i've heard about that for for years like over a decade yeah. i've heard that warner brothers is the most difficult one of the more difficult main studios to get to license out to other studios mm -hmm. some you can tell are just do it willy-nilly uh, like yeah. Sony with their Columbia stuff, Universal with their back catalog, you see those licenses get tossed around all of the time. Yeah. But Warner Brothers, I guess, want to do everything in house, really, yeah. and just not sharing at all. I but mean, I can respect, that, I can respect that, in and in, 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 in to the point where you're not, if you're not putting it out, then what are you doing? What's the you're point? Just, you know you're just, I mean? you're just holding it hostage for nobody to get. That's so. why you know when we started this podcast was right around the time where we thought Warner Archive was going to not exist anymore mm -hmm. so it's like okay we're not going to have access to warner brothers catalog they're a rich hundred year catalog yeah. but obviously two years later and they're still putting out their their blu-rays which look immaculate whatever yeah. they're doing with warner archive releases don't stop because they look in they look incredible with their mm. 4k 2k restorations and all that i just hope it doesn't fold anytime soon but you never know with them the way they're structuring right now yeah. They, they're trying to save money any way they can. It's yeah. all a money game. Yeah. yeah. But uh, based off of what you're telling me, um, seems like we need to get you on our other show, the unwatched pile. Um, so, uh, <laughs> because we did, because we do have another show where we, where we all make a decision to pick one movie out of our unwatched pile stack and then talk about it and then pair it with something else in our collection that we've already seen as a fun like double feature thing. So we might yeah. have to bring you back to do that show so yeah, that sure. we can help we can help you with your pile. Um, Thank you. That'd be a pleasure. Well, we need help. We just need help. Oh yes. We need help with our piles. <laughs> <laughs> but uh I appreciate you guys coming on to talk with us. I, I appreciate that uh though you're in this back you know you know you're out in the middle of nowhere uh backwoods you were right the first time. <laughs> yeah back, he, backwoods he, he, you know he almost didn't want to say that because he, I didn't he want probably to say thought it was going to sound like, is insulting is, is, is it yeah. woods is it backwoods are you are they the texas chainsaw message no <laughs> yeah, uh, can, you, can you see my six fingers oh. yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> yes um but no i i appreciate that that even though you're out there um where it's not an easy place to do this that your 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 passion's uh, pushing you forward to uh, to put out great physical media and and like I said once again, um, great great first release tre from Treasured Films, The Last Hunter, um, well worth a pickup, guys. Yeah, uh, especially if you're into this type of genre, if you're into exploitation stuff, eighty um, cinema, eighty cinema. Yeah, it's it's a really good release, and uh, please please keep an eye on them. They got more coming soon. Yeah, um, for those of you listening, you can. Probably find it on Diabolic, Orbit DVD, maybe Grindhouse has it, Grindhouse Video maybe has it. Um, I know there was another website that if you go to uh, your guys' website, which is uh, treasuredfilms.co.uk, you, you guys tell us where to go to get it. Because I know you guys can only ship within the UK. 
That's right. We can only ship within the UK. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, please but, keep it. But, but, yeah. 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 You know, if, if if American retailers get their hands on some copies, that's nothing to do with this. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it, we don't have no, Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. Please keep an eye on them. Uh, keep up. You know. I, I have a feeling, you know, I can't, I can't say this for sure, but you know, we do the shelf shock rewind awards. Maybe you guys be up for a best new label. Um, you oh. know, hopefully next year, that would be nice. I'd like to see you pop up again. Oh, so, uh, that'd be nice. So we'll that's see, good. we'll see yeah, how it goes. And thank you uh, for your time guys. And you're really of course. Appreciate it. No, at any time, man, we'll do this again. Um, sure. but, uh, have a good rest of your day guys. And we'll see you around. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Stephen. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.